Hi, Dale coming to you from my temporary garage again, and I'm here with my son, Eric, again. We're still working on building Eric a lot more organizational and storage items for his room. If you remember- Hey dad, I can't wait to start building this. Can we just get started? Okay then. In this video, Eric's gonna punch autism right in the mouth by making this awesome bookshelf. Come on, let's go. The first thing I did was teach Eric about mapping out your cuts. I explained that when you are building pieces that you really want to showcase and look nice, that you need to take into consideration grain direction. Since most of this build is using plywood, I also explain how plywood is made with each layer having a different grain direction, which makes it very stable. So grain direction for this would purely be aesthetic and not structural. Later in the video, I have another lesson about this same topic, but with solid wood. Like pretty much every project ever made, Eric starts by breaking down the material to rough sizes. He cuts them about an inch on the large side and will be cutting them to final size later. In Eric's first video project, he used all pocket holes. He's learning about dados for this project and I'm showing him how to measure and use a jig and a pattern bit to make perfect size dados. For this two piece jig, you first measure out where you want the top of the dado cut to be and then take part one of the jig and line it up to your marks. Once you have that clamped down, now simply place the piece that will be going into the dado against the straight edge and clamp the second piece down pressed up against the other side of the piece that will go into the dado. This jig is really just two straight edges with plenty of room for a router to slide across the top. Once you have both pieces clamped down, you can remove your piece between the jig and that will leave the jig perfectly spaced to accept the board into the dado. Now a little lesson explaining how the pattern bit works on the router. Lesson one is don't mess with the business end of the router unless it's unplugged. I show Eric how the bearing will ride along whatever pattern you want and cut away whatever you have attached to the pattern with an exact match. I show him that while our pattern is a straight edge, it can be pretty much any pattern. He thought this was pretty cool. Next lesson for Eric is how to use the router. I explained to make sure that when he starts the router, the bit is not in contact with any of the wood. Then he needs to make sure he has good solid grip on both handles. Because the space we need to cut out is thicker than the bit, he needs to make two passes. The first pass should have the bearing on the bit up against the top straight edge. Then coming back the other way, the bearing should be against the lower straight edge. Now it's Eric's turn. I have to say of all the power tools that I've been teaching Eric with, the handheld router is the one that has me most nervous. I'm still not having him use the palm router yet, but this full size router with two handles moving across a solid base, I'm okay with. I'm still hanging pretty close though. I also instructed Eric that once he completes each pass to go over it again to clean up any areas where he may have come off the straight edge a bit. Because we're only going down a little less than a quarter of an inch, we're setting the depth to the entire depth in one cut. I explained to Eric how we would take multiple passes, adding a little depth each pass if we were going any deeper. Now to check the cut with a piece of the plywood. This piece of plywood we're using has a little bit of a bow, so we needed to tap it in a little, but it fit perfectly. Also, Eric really got a kick out of it when I asked him to hand me the persuader and had to explain that's the mallet. He only calls the mallet the persuader now. We've got two more dados to cut and we're gonna follow the exact same process for both of them. Well, the last one, we're gonna change it up just a little bit because of space. Eric really did a great job cutting these dados and had no issues at all handling the router. 
The piece Eric is cutting the dados in is actually both side pieces. I explained to him that the best way to make sure that the dados line up perfectly on both sides is to cut the dados across a larger piece and then cut that larger piece into the two sides. That way, we're guaranteed to have the dados line up. The bottom dado has a bit of a challenge because the lower side of the jig will overhang too far so that we cannot get clamps on it and be out of the way of the router. No problem. We have some good double-sided tape and place down a couple strips. That should hold just fine. Eric just needs to route in the final dado, which he does perfectly. Show of hands, who thinks Eric is proud of himself? You know what? He should be. I'm sure proud of him. I am using the vacuum to clean the vacuum. Another very important lesson, and that is, routers are one messy tool. Now that the dados are cut, Eric can rip both side pieces. Again, by cutting the dados first in the larger piece, then cutting the side pieces will guarantee the dados line up perfectly on each side. It's time for a new type of joint for Eric to learn. This time, it's a rabbit. I explain how they are very similar to a dado, just at the end of the board. I also wanted to show Eric that we could have easily done these on the router, but they also can be done on the table saw. I explained the important part of cutting rabbits or dados on the table saw is to keep constant downward pressure on the boards while running them over the blade, or it can create an uneven depth. There are several other things Eric got to learn about cutting them this way, and the first is his dad is a bit too cheap to buy a dado set and a saw stop dado break, so that means he gets to make several passes moving the fence a little bit at a time. I think he especially liked the router better when he found out that I have a bit specifically made for this type of cut. I wanted him to learn though that there are multiple ways these joints can be created. Besides, this way he gets to learn even a new skill of cleaning up the cuts afterwards. Now it's time to clean up the rabbit joints, and for that, I thought it would be great to teach Eric a little about chisels. Now, my chisel skills are probably just above Eric's, who has never held a chisel before, so the amount of teaching I'm going to be able to do here is pretty small. I also don't have the sharpest chisels either, so Eric has pretty much everything working against him here. Even with all that, he took his time and eventually ended up with pretty clean rabbit joints. We did end up grabbing a sanding block for the final touches though. Here you can see both side pieces completed and everything lining up perfectly. This was another tool I was a bit nervous about getting into Eric's hands, but my circular saw actually has a pretty quick break on it and these cross cuts were pretty short. He cut all the shelves to rough length here. Once we had all three shelves rough cut to length, we used double-sided tape to tape them all together and flush. We then wrapped them with blue painter's tape just to be sure they would not move. We then clamped the entire thing to our miter gauge and cut both sides. Hey Eric, why did we do this? The reason why we taped them together is so then we can cut them all at once so they're the exact same no matter how we cut it. Eric can now place one side piece against the stop block with the dados and rabbits facing up. Then place a shelf on top of the side piece, flushing both up against the stop block. This will allow Eric to be able to simply mark the shelf at the beginning of the rabbit so we know exactly how deep each shelf needs to be. Hey Eric, what do you say about this technique? Measuring is for chumps. Now Eric can set the table saw fence right at the mark he created and rip all three shelves to that depth. This way he knows all three will be exactly the same depth and exactly the depth from the front of the side pieces to the beginning of the rabbit allowing the back to be put in place directly against the shelves. It's time to assemble the carcass. 
To do that, we want to use the back to help square everything up, but we don't want to glue the back on just yet, so Eric and I taped down some wax paper on the edges of the back piece. We're using Type-On 3 mainly because it gives us a longer set time, which greatly helps reduce the stress of being on the clock once the glue hits the wood. We start by spreading glue in all the dados, making sure we have good coverage. Then it's simply inserting the shelves and tightening the clamps. Big lesson for Eric here was how to check if the box is square. I find it easiest to just simply measure from corner to corner. If the distances from each corner are equal, then you know you're square. While using the back really did help with the assembly and squaring up, you'll see that we still needed to adjust it a bit to get it into square, which was great as that was another lesson for Eric on how to adjust it when it's not square. You can see that Eric was really happy and proud of himself that it is finally starting to look like a bookshelf. Eric needs to cut a couple of strips for the top of the bookshelf and we use relative measuring to mark the pieces because measuring is for chumps. Once the piece is marked, he simply needs to cross cut to length and rip a couple of pieces about two inches wide. The top of the bookshelf is going to be about one and three quarter inch solid wood and Eric will be attaching the top by screwing up through these two top strips into the solid wood top. This is where a lesson in wood movement had to happen. I explained to Eric about solid wood, unlike plywood, will expand and contract. Because of this, we need to make sure that we allow it to move and we want to control the direction it moves. Because of this, we can screw the back of the solid wood top to the bookshelf nice and tight, but the front we will need to allow for movement, even if it's just a tiny bit. This way, any movement will be off to the front of the bookshelf and not to the back where we want it to stay flush. For this, we're simply going to drill standard pilot holes for the back brace, but for the front brace, we will be drilling oversized pilot holes. That way, when we put the screw in the center of the oversized hole, we will allow the top to move a little when it expands and contracts. I'm hoping that made sense. The top braces can be attached by screwing in from the side of the bookshelf. Since we will be adding trim around the top and the bottom, you'll never see these screws. We took the back off and Eric gave it a good sanding. Now he's putting on a coat of primer to get ready for some paint. You can see while Eric works on his project, I'm working on my project that I'm doing for my wife. Look up to the top of this video and you should see a link to that video. Eric chose this blue color for the back of the bookshelf. It took a couple of coats, but unlike me, Eric likes painting. I think you'll agree when you see the finished product that this pair is great with the red oak. It's time to cut and install the face trim. I give Eric a safety lesson on the miter saw and he gets to cut the solid oak face trim. While I'll sometimes assemble the face frame and then install it all at once, I do find it easier to cut and assemble each piece one at a time. For installing the face trim, Eric will be using glue, then a couple of 23 gauge pin nails, mainly just to hold it in place while he applies the clamps. I have to say, Eric is really good at paying attention to the details. He goes the extra effort and really makes sure that everything is really flush. It's the same process for the face trim on the shelves. Eric cuts them to size so that they are snug, then he glues, pin nails, and clamps. We're going to have trim around the top and the base of the bookshelf. We're making it from 3 quarter inch oak boards, 
To add just a little extra detail, Eric uses the router table to put a chamfer on the trim pieces. Next, we set the miter to a 45 so he can cut his first ever miters. The main lesson here to Eric was for the miters to cut it a bit long first and then sneak up on it until you get to the correct length. We start with the top trim by turning the bookshelf over. And I have to say, for Eric's first ever miter cuts, they came out about as perfect as they can be. My first miter nailed it. For the base trim, we turn the bookshelf back to right side up and rinse and repeat, cutting the miters a tad long, then sneaking up on them. Once the dry fit looked good, we then glue and pin nail into place. Okay, at this point, the bookshelf is pretty much done, and now all Eric needs to do is build the top. I don't have enough eight quarter red oak for the top, which ultimately turns out to be a good thing because now he gets to use some maple and walnut to add some bling to his bookshelf top. Eric starts by milling down all the pieces to rough sizes. I don't have much walnut, so he has to resaw that on the table saw. I would have much preferred him using the band saw, but I recently had it repaired and the blade on it has a bend in it so it doesn't cut too straight. Next he got to use a new tool and that is the planer. He really liked how that smoothed everything up. Once he got all the pieces to the proper thicknesses, he could do the final cut so that the top would be the proper depth. After all that work, Eric is really starting to feel and look like a woodworker. Now it's time to glue up the cutting board. I mean, the top to the bookshelf. We're using Type On 3 again so that we have a longer open time and that gives us a bit more time to spread the glue. Eric makes sure to get really good glue coverage before clamping everything down and I do help a little bit just to speed things up. We're gonna do this in two glue ups as the final width is too big for my planer. This way Eric can glue up all but the last piece, then we can run everything through the planer, then glue the final piece on. From there, he can hand sand the remaining glue joint. Another new tool for Eric to use. This time, it's the doweling jig. While dowels make for a really, really strong joint, I explained to Eric that we're not using this for the strength as gluing the edges of these boards will be plenty strong enough. We're doing it to help with alignment. Keeping the top as flush as we can means less sanding later. The key here is to be very certain you're lining up the holes on each board. With all the dowel holes drilled and dry fitting to make sure everything lined up, it's time for the final glue up. Eric asked me if he should put glue directly into the holes and I told him that is a great question and the answer is yes. I instructed him that the holes need glue as well as full glue coverage on the edge of the board. We start with just getting glue in the holes and spread around the inside of the holes. Then we persuade the dowels into the holes. We then spread glue across the edge and glue it all up. Once the glue hit the dowels, they started to expand, so clamping them together was a bit too tough for Eric, so I jumped in to help. Just like we did for the shelves, we clamped the top to my miter gauge and then cut the top to its final length. To attach the top, we placed the top on the bench upside down. Then turn the bookshelf upside down and position it on the top. Eric then used a self-centering drill bit to pre-drill holes exactly in the center of each hole he created earlier in the top brace pieces. If you remember, 
Eric created oversized holes in the front top brace so that when he drives the screws in, there'll be room for the top to expand and contract as moisture content changes. Once he drills in all the screws, the top will be securely attached and will keep the top flush to the back and any and all movement will happen in the front overhang. The last step to assembly is for Eric to put the back in place and staple it down. He uses staples instead of brad nails as the brad nails could go all the way through the thin back piece. The staples really hold on much better. He makes sure to get staples along the top supports, bottom shelf, as well as the two middle shelves so that the back is nice and secure. The last step is putting on some finish. Eric is using satin polyurethane MI spray gun. A total of four coats sanding with 400 grit in between coats. And here it is. And honestly, this is incredibly impressive. Eric, you did an absolutely fantastic job on this. You use a table saw, hand router, router table, nail gun, planer, sander, hand sander. What was your favorite part? My favorite part was I loved using the nail gun. Very simple, very easy, and very fun. Please subscribe, comment, comment below, and until next time, see ya.